Before starting this lesson, let's quickly revise the structure of the atom from Year 10 Science. The centre of an atom contains a positively charged nucleus, which is made from protons and neutrons. Meanwhile, electrons orbit the nucleus in shells. The maximum number of electrons that fit in each shell increases as you go further away from the nucleus. A neutral atom has no net charge, which means the number of protons equals the number of electrons. We can also represent atoms using chemical symbols. The atomic mass is found by adding the number of protons and neutrons, while the atomic number matches the number of protons. The word element is used to describe all atoms with a specified proton number. For example, chlorine refers to any atom with exactly 17 protons in its nucleus. In comparison, isotopes are two or more atoms with the same proton number but different neutron numbers. Chlorine is commonly found in two different isotopes. Chlorine 35 has 18 neutrons while chlorine-37 has 20 neutrons. Therefore, we can think of isotopes as different varieties of the same element. Furthermore, all isotopes of an element undergo the same chemical reactions. In HSC chemistry, we usually don't care about the slight differences between isotopes. This is why we classify atoms into the periodic table of elements instead of a periodic table of isotopes. It's time that we check in with the pirates. In the previous lesson, they finished helping at Senor Ortega's cocoa farm. After saying farewell, they head to the local markets. Long Jane Silver strolls into an antique store and falls in love with a mahogany table. But before she pulls her purse out, a local tells the tale of its haunted history. It was originally commissioned by the late Captain Morgan. Every night, spooky tapping and rattling sounds emanate from inside the locked drawer, whose key is lost to the seven seas. Captain Morgan's ghost is guarding a secret. Long Jane Silver isn't superstitious, so she dismisses his concerns and buys it anyway. Back on board, first mate Phil picks the lock, opens the drawer and finds a mouse scuttling around. After shooing it away, Long Jane Silver notices there are differently coloured jigsaw pieces each one inscribed with strange numbers and letters. With our modern-day chemistry knowledge, we know that these blocks represent elements from the periodic table. But we need to remember this is set in the early 1700s and the periodic table hadn't been invented yet. This means the pirates will need to organise the elements without the advantage of hindsight. In other words, they're doing a jigsaw puzzle without seeing the image on the box. To solve this puzzle, they need to look for patterns. Perhaps they should make a pile for each colour. Maybe they could place the blocks in alphabetical order. Or what about ranking the numbers from smallest to largest? With no hints available, they try each method. Firstly, they make a separate pile for each colour, but they hit a brick wall because they don't know how to order the colours. Which colour should be first? Taking a step back, they realise that the colour coding must be important, so they put this thought on hold. Next, they place the blocks in alphabetical order across the table. Unfortunately, the jigsaw pieces don't match. To make things worse, the colours are disorganised. They'll need to try again. Finally, they place the blocks in numerical order. This looks promising. There's exactly one block for each number. What's more, they notice that some blocks follow a colour-coded pattern. They must be on the right path. To date, scientists have discovered 118 elements. 
To keep track of everything, we organise the elements by increasing atomic number. But why is the atomic number so important? Well, the number of protons determines the number of electrons orbiting the nucleus, which influences the element's physical and chemical properties. For example, helium contains two protons, so a neutral helium atom is surrounded by two electrons. This makes helium a noble gas because it has a complete outer shell. We'll discuss this further over the next two lessons. Back on the ship, first mate Phil spots a rectangular recession in the table surface. This must be where the jigsaw pieces fit. Hence, they will need to organise the blocks in a rectangle to finish solving this puzzle. Long Jane Silver realises that some colours appear in a regular pattern and some blocks have straight edges, which is a bit of a giveaway. Then it clicks. Each column has a different colour. Long Jane Silver moves segments underneath each other so that some colours line up. Then she encounters a new problem. Some sections are really narrow, but others are very wide. How can the pieces form a rectangle when they have different widths? First mate Phil rummages through the drawers and finds a hessian bag of blank puzzle pieces. He has an idea. He uses these blanks to add horizontal gaps between the blocks in the shorter segments. This way, the colours at the start and end of each row align perfectly. When the last piece is set, a lock clicks open, revealing a map to Captain Morgan's treasure trove. Their eyes gleam with excitement as they plan another adventure. As we can see, the elements are sorted into columns in the periodic table. Each column contains elements with similar physical and chemical properties, as represented by the colour coding. For example, royal blue represents the alkaline earth metals and pink represents the noble gases. To ensure the columns align perfectly, we need to add horizontal gaps between some elements. We'll explain why some rows are wider than others in our videos on electron configurations in Topic 2, Atomic Structure and Atomic Mass. Let's summarise what we've learned in the first half of this lesson by defining the periodic table of elements. This is a table of chemical elements ordered by atomic number, that is, the number of protons in the nucleus so that elements with similar atomic structure, physical properties and chemical properties are grouped together. Next, let's explore how the periodic table relates to atomic structure. A period is a horizontal row of the periodic table and corresponds to the number of electron shells in a neutral atom. For example, sodium is in period 3, so a neutral sodium atom has three electron shells. At the time of writing, there are seven rows in the periodic table, but if new elements are discovered, it will expand to eight rows. On the other hand, a group is a vertical column of the periodic table. It categorises neutral atoms by their electron configuration. In simple cases, the group corresponds to the number of valence electrons. Since sodium is in group 1, it has one electron in its outer shell. For the right-hand side of the table, we subtract 10 from the group number. Thus, oxygen is in group 16 and has 6 valence electrons, while krypton is in group 18 and has 8 valence electrons. The rules are pretty complicated, so we'll discuss them in our upcoming videos on electron configurations. Each cell in the periodic table displays the key information for each element, just like an ID card. The official name is at the very bottom. The top of each cell shows the atomic number, or the number of protons, in the nucleus. Below this is the element's symbol 
The first letter is always capitalised and the remaining letters are written in lowercase. The final value is the element's standard atomic weight. In short, this refers to the average mass of an element on Earth. For example, carbon is mostly found as the isotope carbon-12, but sometimes we encounter carbon-13 in nature. As a result, the average mass of a carbon atom on Earth is 12.01. We'll discuss this further in our upcoming video on relative atomic mass. You might have noticed that the standard atomic weight increases as you move right and down the periodic table. However, this isn't always true. For example, cobalt is heavier than nickel, even though it appears earlier. This is because cobalt is more commonly found as a heavier isotope, while nickel is more commonly found as a lighter isotope. Remember, we organise elements by their proton number. They are not sorted by mass. As mentioned earlier, the standard atomic weight is the average mass of an element on Earth. Elements with a standard atomic weight can be found naturally in the ground, water or air. On the contrary, if an element's standard atomic weight is missing, then all isotopes are radioactive. It can only be produced artificially in nuclear reactors or particle colliders. Next, we will briefly classify elements as metals, nonmetals, and metalloids based on their physical and chemical properties. Metals form the majority of the periodic table. For instance, iron is a good conductor of electricity, lustrous, which means that it looks shiny, and ductile, so it can be bent into shape. All metals are similar to iron because they are good electrical conductors, lustrous and ductile. On the other side of the periodic table are nonmetals. Although carbon is a moderate conductor of electricity, most nonmetals cannot conduct electricity. Carbon has a very dull appearance and is brittle, which means that it breaks when you try to bend it. As we can see, nonmetals are almost the complete opposite of metals. Lastly, we have the metalloids, which are sometimes known as semi-metals. For example, silicon is lustrous, like metals, brittle, like nonmetals, and has moderate electrical conductivity between that of metals and nonmetals. In general, metalloids are hard to classify because they have a bit of both worlds. We can identify metalloids in the periodic table by drawing a staircase. Starting left of boron, we draw lines alternating down and right until we reach the bottom. Elements that border this staircase are usually considered metalloids. This includes boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony and tellurium. Scientists are still debating about whether some elements, such as polonium and astatine, are also metalloids, so you won't be asked about them in HSC chemistry. When using this method, it's important to remember that aluminium is a metal. Therefore, aluminium is an exception to the staircase rule. We can also classify elements based on their group or vertical column. Group 1 contains the alkali metals, each having one valence electron. They are very reactive, sometimes producing explosions when they react with water. Group 2 elements are the alkaline earth metals. They have two valence electrons and are less reactive than group 1 elements. Groups 3 to 12 are referred to as transition metals. They usually have one or two electrons in their outermost shell. If we jump to group 17, we find the halogens, which have seven valence electrons. They are also very reactive because they are one electron away from having a full valence shell. Finally, 
The group 18 elements are noble gases. They have two or eight valence electrons and do not form chemical bonds or react with other substances. Finally, we can use the periodic table to make predictions by extrapolating the patterns we observe. For instance, we can predict the properties of element 119, which is yet to be discovered. This comes after element 118, and since the seventh row is completely full, element 119 will appear in group 1 of period 8. From its position, we can infer that it has eight electron shells and one electron in its valence shell. All elements in group 1 are alkali metals, apart from hydrogen, which is an exception to the rule. Hence, we can predict that element 119 will be an alkali metal. Consequently, it will be lustrous, a good conductor of electricity, malleable, and react vigorously with water. Finally, all elements with atomic numbers greater than 92 are radioactive, so there's a good chance that it will also be radioactive. Even though element 119 hasn't been discovered, we already know a lot about it, thanks to the periodic table. Before we finish, let's consider the types of questions you might be asked in exams. Questions may include, what do the terms atomic number, group and period mean? Which elements fit the given criteria? And how is the periodic table organised? Let's revise what we've covered in this lesson. In the HSC chemistry course, you will need to read and identify patterns in the periodic table. The periodic table is a table of chemical elements arranged by atomic number so that elements with similar atomic structure, physical properties and chemical properties are grouped together. The elements are not sorted by mass because in some situations the heavier elements appear first. A period is a horizontal row of the periodic table. It corresponds to the number of electron shells in a neutral atom. On the other hand, a group is a vertical column of the periodic table. It categorises neutral atoms by their electron configuration. Metals form the majority of the elements in the periodic table. In general, they are good electrical conductors, lustrous and malleable. Non-metals appear on the far right-hand side of the periodic table. Usually, they are poor electrical conductors, dull and brittle. Metalloids form a diagonal in the periodic table. They have a mixture of characteristics between those of metals and non-metals, which makes them difficult to classify. When using the staircase method, remember that aluminium is a metal. Some groups are given their own names. This includes the alkali metals, alkaline earth metals, transition metals, halogens and noble gases. By following trends in the periodic table, we can predict the characteristics of elements. To conclude, we've annotated the periodic table to show all the important regions. Pause the video here if you would like to read it and copy it down. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on chemistry, check out our video on the physical properties of elements.